Welcome back to the video. This one is part of the Randolph Carter Tales. It was written by H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, the story is called The Silver Key. It's a fairly long one. The first time I read through it, it was about an hour and a half. So we'll have to see what happens to it. And thank you all so much for being here. Without further ado, it's Lovecraft. When Randolph Carter was 30, he lost the key of the Gate of Dreams. Prior to that, he had made up for the prosiness of life by nightly excursions to strange and ancient cities beyond space, and lovely, unbelievable garden lands across ethereal seas. But as middle age hardened upon him, he felt these liberties slipping away little by little until at last he was cut off altogether. No more could see his galleys sail up the river Okranos, past the gilded spires of Thrain, or his elephant caravans tramp through perfumed jungles in Kled, where forgotten palaces were vined ivory combs, sleep lovely and unbroken under the moon. He had read much of things as they are, and talked with too many people. Well-meaning philosophers had taught him to look into the logical relations of things and analyze the processes which shaped his thoughts and fancies. Wonder had gone away, and he had forgotten that all life is only a set of pictures in the brain among which there is no difference betwixt those born of real things and those born of inward dreamings, and no cause to value the one over the other. Custom had dined into his ears a superstitious reverence for that which tangibly and physically exists, and had made him secretly ashamed to dwell in vision. Wise men told him simple fancies are inane and childish, and he believed it because he could see that they might easily be so. What he failed to recall was that the deeds of reality are just as inane and childish, and even more absurd because their actors persist in fancying them full of meaning and purpose as the blind cosmos grinds aimlessly on from nothing to something, and from something back to nothing again, neither heeding nor knowing the wishes or existence of the minds that flicker for a second now and then in the darkness. They had chained him down to things that are and had then explained the workings of those things, till mystery had gone out of the world. <clears throat> when he complained, and longed to escape into twilight realms where magic molded all the little vivid fragments, and prized associations of his mind into vistas of breathless expectancy and unquenchable delight. They turned him instead toward the newfound prodigies of science, bidding him find wonder in the atom's vortex and mystery in the sky's dimensions. And, when he had failed to find these boons in things whose laws are known and measurable, they told him he lacked imagination and was immature because he preferred dream illusions to the illusions of our physical creation. So Carter had tried to do as others did and pretended that the common events and emotions of earthly mind were more important than the fancies of rare and delicate souls. He did not dissent 
when they told him that the animal pain of a stuck pig or dyspeptic plowman in real life is a greater thing than the peerless beauty of Narav, with its hundred carven gates and domes of Chalcedony. Chalcedony, which he dimly remembered from his dreams, and under their guidance, he cultivated a painstaking sense of pity and tragedy. Once in a while, though, he could not help seeing how shallow, fickle, and meaningless all human aspirations are, and how emptily our real impulses contrast with those pompous ideals we profess to hold. Then he would have recourse to the polite laughter they had taught him to use against the extravagance and artificiality of dreams. For he saw that the daily life of our world is every inch as extravagant and artificial and far less worthy of respect because of its poverty and beauty and its silly reluctance to admit its own lack of reason and purpose. In this way, he became a kind of humorist, for he did not see that even humor is empty in a mindless universe, devoid of any true standard of consistency or inconsistency. <clears throat> In the first days of his bondage, he had turned to the gentle churchly faith endeared to him by the naive trust of his fathers, for thence stretched mystic avenues which seemed to promise escape from life. Only on closer view did he mark the uh, starved fancy and beauty, the stale and prosy triteness, and the owlish gravity and grotesque claims of solid truth, which reigned, bore solemnly and overwhelmingly among most of its professors. Or feel to the full the awkwardness with which it sought to keep alive, as literal fact, the outgrown fears and guesses of a primal race confronting the unknown. <clears throat> it wearied Carter to see how solemnly people tried to make earthly reality out of old myths, which every step of their boasted science confuted. And this misplaced seriousness killed the attachment he might have kept for the ancient creeds had they been content to offer the sonorous rites and emotional outlets in their true guise of eternal fancy, ethereal fancy. But when he came to study those who had thrown off the old myths, he found them even more ugly than those who had not. They did not know that beauty lies in harmony, and that loveliness of life has no standard among an aimless cosmos, save only its harmony with the dreams and the feelings which have gone before and blindly molded our little spheres out of the rest of chaos. They did not see that good and evil, and beauty and ugliness, are only ornamental fruits of perspective, whose sole value lies in their linkage of what chance made our fathers think and feel, and whose finer details are different from every race and culture. Instead, they either denied these things altogether or transferred them to the crude, vague instincts, which they shared with the beasts and peasants. 
so that their lives were dragged maladorously out in pain, ugliness, and disproportion. Yet, filled with a ludicrous pride at having escaped from something no more unsound than that which still held them. They had traded their false gods of fear and blind piety for those of license and anarchy. Carter did not taste deeply of these modern freedoms. For their cheapness and squalor sickened a spirit-loving beauty alone. While his reason rebelled at the flimsy logic with which their champions tried to gild brute impulse with a sacredness stripped from the idols they had discarded. He saw that most of them, in common with their cast-off priestcraft, could not escape from the delusion that life has a meaning apart from that which men dream into it. <clears throat> and could not lay aside the crude notion of ethics and obligations beyond those of beauty, even when all nature shrieked of its unconsciousness and impersonal unmorality in the light of their scientific discoveries, warped and bigoted with the preconceived illusions of justice, freedom, and consistency. They cast off the old lore and the old ways with the old beliefs, nor ever stop to think that the lore and those ways were the sole makers of their present thoughts and judgments, and the sole guides and standards in a meaningless universe without fixed aims or stable points of reference. Having lost these artificial settings, their lives grew void of direction and dramatic interest, till at length, they strove to drown their ennui in bustle and pretended usefulness. Noise and excitement, barbaric display and animal sensation. When these things pall, disappointed, or grew nauseous through revulsion, they cultivated irony and bitterness and found fault with the social order. Never could they realize that their brute foundations were as shifting and contradictory as the gods of their elders, and that the satisfaction of one moment is the bane of the next. Calm, lasting beauty comes only in dreams. And this solace the world had thrown away when in its worship of the real, it threw away the secrets of childhood and innocence. Amidst this chaos of hollowness and unrest, Carter tried to live as be, uh, befitted a man of keen thought and good heritage. With his dreams fading under the ridicule of the age, he could not believe in anything, but the love of harmony kept him close to the ways of his race and station. He walked impassive through the cities of Maine, and sighed because no vista seemed fully real, because every flash of yellow sunlight on tall roofs and every glimpse of balustrated plazas in the first lamps of evening served only to remind him of dreams he had once known, and to make him homesick from ethereal lands he no longer knew how to find. Travel was only a mockery, and even the great war stored him, stirred him but little. Though he served from the first in the Foreign Legion of France, 
For a while, he sought friends, but soon grew weary of the crudeness of their emotions and the sameness of earthy, oh, and earthiness of their visions. He felt vaguely glad that all his relatives were distant and out of touch with him. For they could not have understood his mental life. That is, none but his grandfather and great uncle Christopher could, and they were long dead. Then he began once more the writing of books, which he had left off when dreams first failed him. But here, too, was there no satisfaction or fulfillment, for the touch of earth was upon his mind, and he could not think of lovely things as he had done of yore. Ironic humor dragged down all the twilight minarets he reared, and the earthly fear of improbability blasted all the delicate and amazing flowers in his fairy gardens. Fairy Gardens The convention of amused oops the convention of assumed pity split mawkishness on his characters, while the myth of an important reality and significant human events and emotions debased all his high fancy into thin vague uh, into thin-veiled allegory and cheap social satire. His new novels were successful as his old ones had never been, and because he knew how empty they must be to please an empty herd, he burned them and ceased his writing. They were very graceful novels, in which he urbanely laughed at the dreams he lightly sketched. But he saw that their sophistication had sapped all their life away. It was after this that he cultivated deliberate illusion and dabbled in the notions of the bizarre and the eccentric as an anecdote for the commonplace. Most of these, however, soon showed their poverty and barrenness. And he saw that the popular doctrines of occultism are as dry and inflexible as those of science. Yet, without even the slender, palliative, uh, palliative truth to redeem them, gross stupidity, falsehood, and muddled thinking are not dream and form no escape from life to a mind trained above their level. So Carter oops. So Carter bought stranger books and sought out deeper and more terrible men of fantastic erudition delving into arcane and consciousness oops delving into arcana of consciousness that few have tried and learning things above the secret pits of life legend and immemorial antiquity which disturbed him ever afterwards he decided to live on a rarer plane and furnished his boston home to suit his changing moods. One room for each, hung in appropriate colors, furnished with befitting books and objects, and provided with sources of the proper sensations of light, heat, sound, taste, and odor. Once he heard of a man in the South who was shunned and feared for the blasphemous things he read in prehistoric books and clay tablets smuggled from India and Arabia. Him he visited living with him 
and shared his studies for seven years, till horror overtook them one midnight in an unknown and archaic graveyard, and only one emerged where two had entered. Then he went back to Arkham, the terrible witch-haunted town of his forefathers in New England, and had experiences in the dark, amidst the hoary willows and tottering gambrel roofs, which made him seal forever certain pages in the diary of a wild-minded ancestor. But these horrors took him only to the edge of reality, and were not of the true dream country he had known in youth, so that at fifty he despaired of any rest or contentment in a world grown too busy for beauty and too shrewd for dream. Having perceived at last the hollowness and futility of real things, Carter spent his days in retirement and in wistful, disjointed memories of his dream-filled youth. He thought it rather silly that he bothered to keep on living at all, and got from a South American acquaintance a very curious liquid to take him to oblivion without suffering. Inertia and force of habit, however, caused him to differ, uh, defer action, and he lingered indecisively among thoughts of old times taking down the strange hangings from his walls and refitting the house as it was in his early boyhood. Purple panes, Victorian furniture, and all. With the passage of time, he became almost glad he had lingered. For his relics of youth and his cleavage from the world made life and sophistication seem very distant and unreal. So much so, that a touch of magic and expectancy stole back into his nightly slumbers. For years, those slumbers had known only such twisted reflections of everyday things, as the commonest slumbers know. But now, there returned a flicker of something stranger and wilder, something of vaguely awesome eminence which took the form of tensely clear pictures from his childhood days and made him think of little inconsequential things he had long forgotten. He would often awake, calling for his mother and grandfather, both in their graves a quarter of a century. Then one night, his grandfather reminded him of a key. The gray old scholar as vivid as in life, spoke long and earnestly of their ancient line, and of the strange visions of the delicate and sensitive men who composed it. He spoke of the flame-eyed crusader who learnt wild secrets of the Saracens that held him captive and of the first Sir Randolph Carter, who studied magic when Elizabeth was queen. He spoke, too, of that Edmund Carter, who had just escaped hanging in the Salem witchcraft, and who had placed in an antique box a great silver key handed down from his ancestors. Before Carter awake, the gentle visitant had told him where to find that box. That carven oak box of archaic wonder, whose grotesque lid no hand had raised for two centuries. In the dust and shadows of the great attic he found it, remote and forgotten at the back of a drawer in a tall chest. It was about a foot square, and its gothic, Carvings were so fearful that he did not marvel no person since Edmund Carter had dared to open it. It gave forth no noise when shaken, 
but was mystic with the sense of unremembered spices. That it held a key was indeed only a dim legend, and Randolph Carter's father had never known such a box existed. It was bound in rusty iron, and no means was provided for working the formidable lock. Carter vaguely understood that he would find within it some key to the lost gate of dreams. But of where and how to use it, his grandfather had told him nothing. All right, I'm going to go on ahead and call it. It's been long enough. I need to go on ahead and stop and make a second part. I'll see you soon.